Okay, testing, testing. What does this say right there? That's right, Shabbat Shalom. What's the name of the Torah portion today? Balak. And does anybody know what Balak means? Does anybody know who Balak was? Who was Balak? All right. We now know who hasn't read the Torah portion. <laughs> Balak was the king of the Moabites. And guess what his name means? The Terminator. All right. So here we go. He is the Terminator, the destroyer. All right. Now, guess what? If you look at your first verse, Balak was the son of who? Now here, you're trying to come across, see, like the Terminator, you're mean. And you're the son of Zippor. I'm the son of Little Bird. <laughs> it kind of deflates your Terminator effect when you're the son of Little Bird. And we see in verses three through five, here he's the king of Moab. And... Uh, where did Moab come from? Anyone remember where the Moabites came from? Lot. At the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, his two daughters thought the world had ended, so they have relations with ships with their dad. And Moab means from father. That's what that name means. And so the Moabites and the Ammonites came from that relation. And remember, if they came from Lot, they're related to Abraham. Lot was Abraham's nephew. And they're exceedingly afraid of Israel because they were many, and Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. Now, think about this. This is so important to today. We, everything was written for our example. The Moabites had nothing to fear from Israel. God even told Israel, don't you even touch the Moabites because I've given their possession for the children of Lot. How many of you know our perceptions can drive us to do something and our perception is completely wrong? This is why the biggest battle is in the mind. We perceive a situation to be a certain way and it's not the way it's supposed to be. And it says, here they're sick with dread. They're terrified, but nothing's going to happen. So what does Moab do? They say to the elders of who? Midian. Who is Moses married to? A Midianite. Not only that, you're going to see Midian was also a relative of Israel. And look at what they say. These people are going to lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, the son of Zippor, who was king of the Moabites at that time, he sent messengers to who? There he is, Balaam. Basically, his name means a foreigner. And... He was the son of Beor at Pathor, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people to call him. And look at what they say. A people has come from Egypt and they're covering the face of the entire earth. And they're my neighbors. They're settling next to me. We can't have that. So what is so important is realizing how our perceptions can be so wrong. Okay, who remembers Tara? What were Tara's sons' names? Who? Who? Big test. Abraham, and who else? Uh, yeah, it was Haran, Nahor, and Abram. And what does Nahor, his name mean? Snorer. He was the first snorer of the Bible. Okay, so... Who came from Haran? Now, well, let me say this. If you remember, Terah 
Abram's father built pagan idols for Nimrod. And then what happens, Abraham goes and destroys the idol shop. Terah gets upset, goes to Nimrod and says, Abram destroyed the idols. And so Nimrod, the king of Babylon, what does he do? He takes Abram and throws him in the fiery furnace. And then he turned to Haran and said, do you believe in the same God as Abram? And Haran was saying, well, let me see if Abraham survives or not, you know. And Abraham survived. He goes, yeah. So he takes Haran and throws him in the fiery furnace. But Haran dies before the face of his father in the Ur of Chaldees, which means his father saw his son Haran die in the fiery furnace. And so that's why Abram picks up Sarah, Lot, you know, off they go to a city that is called Haran. So who, so I just gave you kind of a roundabout thing. So who come, who was Haran who died? Who were his kids? Can you name one of Haran's kids? Lot, exactly. And who was Lot the father of? I just told you. The Moab. That's right. Now, does anyone know who the grandson of Moab was? Balak. Balak. Or Torah portion. And does anyone know who the grandson of Balak was? Eglon. Now, who remembers Eglon? We're going to talk about we're going to talk about Eglon in just a little bit. Who was the grandchild of Eglon? Ruth. Ruth. Now let's go to Nahor. Who were the descendants of Nahor? Rebecca, Rachel, Leah. All these are Terah's kids. Now, Terah also had a daughter. These are the three sons. Does anyone remember Terah's daughter's name? Sarah. Okay, but from another wife. So Abram and Nahor and Haran are half-brothers to Sarah. And we know from them came Isaac, who married Rebekah, and Jacob, who married Rachel and Leah. But guess what? Abram had another wife, Keturah, and from her came the Midianites. So here you see they all came from Terah and you have the Moabites trying to get with the elders of the Midianites to destroy Jacob's descendants. So this is just a, you know, internal war thing that's going on. And let's look at Numbers 22, 6. Let me see. What do we have? He says to Balaam, please come at once and curse this people for me, for they are too strong for me. And then he has, says, uh, perhaps I'll be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know, look what he says to Balaam, he whom you bless is blessed and he whom you curse is cursed. Wow. Wow. Isn't that fascinating? We know in the book of Jacob, which is called James, it says blessing and cursing shouldn't come out of the same mouth. So this is already telling us that Balaam uh, definitely has a problem. But also what's fascinating to me is whoever you bless is blessed, whoever you curse is cursed. Where have we heard that from? Yeah, Abraham. That's what God told Abraham. And who was with Abraham when this was proclaimed? Lot. So Lot heard this and he passed it on down to his kids. And so they're now taking that and applying it, though, to Balaam or Balaam. Um, but you know what's fascinating about me, about this, uh, what I'm thinking? Why didn't they just say to Balaam, bless us? why curse them? You know. We'll look at Numbers 22, 7 through 12. So here we see the elders of Moab, the elders of Midian get together 
Now, they're not the king. These are just the leaders. And they depart with money to give Balaam. And they come to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. And he said to them, lodge here tonight. I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. Now look what happens. God comes to Balaam and he says, who are these guys with you? And Balaam said to God, well, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me saying, behold, a people has come out of Egypt. It covers the face of the earth. Come and curse them for me. Perhaps I'll be able to fight against them and drive them out. And so look what God says. You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. Okay, so this is, we're going to talk about how people manipulate words here. How many of you know people, they tell you the truth, but not the whole truth? Watch what Balaam does. God says to him, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse them. And so Balaam got up in the morning of verse 13, and he says to the princes of Balak, go back to your own land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So they're thinking, oh, I guess a higher official is needed. And so we better go back and tell Balak someone more important than us. He didn't come across saying, for this God doesn't want to have them cursed. He just says, God doesn't want me to go with you. You're two little peons, you know. And so let's look what happens. He, then he goes and he says, the Lord has refused to let me go with you. And now look at the prince's response to Balak. They come back to the king and they say, Balaam refuses to come with us. So this softens the thing as if God's mind might be changed under the right circumstances. So Balaam misunderstands God because of his relationship. And Balaam desperately wants to go, but he can't go against God. And so look at Numbers 22, 14. The princes of Moab rose up, went to Balak and said, Balak refuses to come with us. Oh, maybe we need to send someone more important. And so let's look at verse 15 through 20. So once again, Balak sent princes more in number, more honorable than the other ones. And they came to Balaam and said, thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will surely do you great honor. And whatever you say to me, I'll do. Come and curse this people for me. But Balaam again answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God to do less or more. So please stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And look what happens. God came to Balaam at night. And look at what he says to him. If the men have come to call you, rise and what? Go with them, but only do what I tell you. Okay, so the, is it okay if he goes with them? But he says, only do what I tell you. And then look at this. In Numbers 22, 21, Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. But look at the next verse. But God's anger was kindled because he went. What? Now, how many of you wondered, what? <laughs> this is why English is so horrible. We're going to look at the Hebrew. When God says, you know, you can go uh, with them, there's two different Hebrew words. Imahem means, I don't want you to go with them if there is a common purpose. Yet the word etam means going with them, but not embracing their purpose. Okay, so what God, again, I don't know how many of you, many of you have heard the story of, uh, remember the movie or the TV series Cops? You know, what you gonna do when they come for you? Bad guys, bad guys. <laughs> and they had videos of these people, you know, arresting them. My son was on that. 
Yeah. My son was in uh, Virginia and he, with his friend. They were in their early 20s, and they were having fun. They were at a party, whatever. They get uh, separated, and my son is walking along the road. He wants to get a ride back to where they were, and this lady pulls up in a pickup and says, sure, hop in. So he just hops in, and they're going down the road, and all of a sudden, a bunch of police cars stop him because she had just robbed a bank. <laughs> or a gas, it was a gas station. She had just robbed a gas station. And my son says, I was with her, but I wasn't with her. You understand? I was with her, but I mean, they, uh, they just beat the bejeebies out of my son, and they ended up taking him across the border and dropped him off in North Carolina or something like that. And, you know, so it was really bad for my poor son because they thought he was with her. Well, he was with her, but he wasn't with her. That's what this is saying. God says you can go as long as you don't go with the purpose of cursing. And so Balaam went and God was mad because God knows the heart and he knew he went with the same purpose to curse. Do you see why English isn't really good, but Hebrew is a lot better. It helps us understand. Okay, now what do we see? It goes on, uh, God's anger was kindled because he went and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way of his adversary. Now Balaam Let's bring up the donkey. Here's the donkey. And now he was riding on the donkey, and he had his two servants with him. You know what's fascinating about this? It talks about Abraham getting on his donkey and taking his two servants with him when they were going to take Isaac, and he was going to offer him up. There's a big-time parallel here between Abraham and Balaam. All right. Now, look at Numbers 22. 23 through 28, the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand. And so the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side, a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord. He thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot, which was to tell him God did not like the way he was going. Okay, there's, if you remember, one of the blemishes was a broken foot. And so here, Balaam, because God doesn't like his way he's walking, breaks his foot against the wall. And so he hit her, the donkey again. And then the angel of the Lord goes further, and he stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn to the right or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she falls down under Balaam. Now Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. And then the Lord opens the mouth of the ass, and she says to Balaam, here we go, what does she say? What did I do to you? Okay, and then she goes, why did you hit me these three times? Well, what happens? Balaam says to the ass, because you mocked me. I wish there was a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. Well, so let's go over here to Balaam. I'd kill you if I had a sword in my hand. And God opens the eyes, and the angel of the Lord has a sword pointed at Balaam and says, Now tell me again, why did you hit your donkey three times? Guess what? I got a sword in my hand. I'm going to kill you and leave your dumb ass alive. <laughs> and... Numbers 22, verse 31 through 33, the Lord opens the eyes of Balaam. He saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with a sword drawn in his hand, and he bows his head, fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Now do tell me again why you've smitten your ass three times. 
Behold, I went out to withstand you because your way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless he had turned from me, surely now also I would have killed you and saved her alive. You know, it's amazing. Balaam always says he's the one who could see. All right. He could see physically. But when it comes to real revelation, he didn't have a clue. You know why he didn't have a clue? His motivation was wrong. He had an ulterior motive. Whether it's money or power, a person can literally become completely blind. God can actually spell it out, but he will not see it. This is what is so frightening. It can be as clear as day to an objective observer, but the person on his way to sin cannot see what is in front of his own eyes. Look at what's coming to America very shortly. Most people are clueless. They have no idea what's coming. They're not ready. But God is about to judge America like you have never seen before by the end of this year. Now, you know what's amazing about this Torah portion? It's my Torah portion when I was born. My Torah portion is Balak and the dumbass, and here I'm speaking, <laughs> you know. But anyways. Look at Revelation. Revelation, we know, is about the end times. Chapter 2, verse 12 and 14, there's a church in Pergamos. And God said to John, write these things, saith he that has the sharp sword with two edges. This is referring back to Balaam. This story refers to Balaam. He says, I know, and he's speaking to the church and it says, I know your works, where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is. You hold fast my name. You've not denied my faith, even in those days when Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. Isn't that interesting that in the last days we see a Christian assembly where the seat of Satan is that is putting stumbling blocks in front of Israel, just like Balaam and Balak. Now, Balaam or uh, Balaam or Balak. Okay, Balak, the king of Moab's grandson was Eglon, okay? And then, of course, Ruth was the granddaughter of Eglon. And in Numbers 23, 9 through 11, look at this. He says, for from the top of the rocks, I see him. From the hills, I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. And then it says, who can count the dust of Jacob? What does that mean exactly? Who can count the dust of Jacob? I will tell you in a second. In the number of the fourth part of Israel, he says, let me die the death of the righteous. Let my last end be like his. And so Balak says to Balaam, what in the world are you doing? I told you to curse my enemies and you're blessing them. Well, when it says who can count the dust of Jacob, this comes from Genesis 13, 14 through 16, where the Lord tells Abram after Lot was separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, north, south, east, west, because all the land you see, I will give it into your seed forever, and I will make your seed as what? How many of you know there's a lot of dust on the earth? Okay, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then they could number your seed. Wow. Now look at Numbers 23, 21. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither has he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord as God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. And what's the Hebrew word for shout here? Teruah, which is Rosh Hashanah, Yom Teruah. The king comes with a shout. And this event will happen on the Feast of Trumpets some year. And notice, 
He, he doesn't see any iniquity in Jacob. He doesn't see any perverseness in Israel. Why? Because the Feast of Yom Kippur is coming where Israel will be cleansed. Now look at Numbers 23, 23 and 24. It says, surely there's no enchantment against Jacob. Neither is there any divination against Israel. In other words, no one's going to be able to curse them. According to this time, it will be said of Jacob and of Israel, what in the world has God done? Behold, the people will rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He'll not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink the blood of the slain. And then look at the next chapter. God brought him out of Egypt. He has, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He will eat up the nations, his enemies. He'll break their bones, pierce them through with arrows. He couched, he lay down as a lion and as a great lion. Who is going to stir him up? And then blessed is he that blesses you and cursed is he that curses you. So this goes back to what Abraham said. Now, what's amazing is there's two Hebrew words for curse in there. One of them, one of the word curse, the first word, you know, it, it talks about someone who uh, the word curse means d uh, just say something unflattering, who says something unflattering. So God is saying, whoever just kind of despises you, I'm going to put a major curse. So the first curse is a light curse, and the second curse is a major curse. So God says concerning the nations, anyone who in any way puts you down, I'm going to destroy. So that is huge. Okay, so Numbers 24, 17. Listen to what Balaam says. This is amazing. I shall see him. But not now. I shall behold him, but not near. In other words, I don't see the Messiah now, but I'm going to see the Messiah soon, but it's going to take a little while. There shall come a star out of Jacob. Here is the star of Bethlehem. Okay. And a scepter shall rise out of Israel and will strike the corners of Moab and destroy all the sons of Israel. Tumult. And so here, what do we see? This is a verse talking about the Messiah. And that is why they were looking at a star and they followed the star when Messiah was born. It was because of this verse. Now jump back over to Revelation twenty-two sixteen. 16. I, Yeshua, have sent my angel to testify these things to you for the assemblies I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So let's go to Numbers 24, 5 through 7. It says, how goodly are your tents, Jacob, and your tents, Israel. Now, we know Jacob is Israel. Uh, Hebrew poetry is saying the same thing twice, but in a little different way. And then it says, as valleys, they are spread forth as gardens by the riverside, as aloes, which the Lord has planted, as cedar trees besides the waters. It says, water shall flow from his buckets. His seed shall be in many waters. His king will be higher than Agag. His kingdom will be exalted. Well, what does it mean when he says they'll be by the riverside? What that means is they're going to stay near water, which is a reference to the Torah. The Torah is the water that descended from heaven. And it seems there is a natural progression throughout these blessings. Number one, stay close to the Torah. Number two, God will help us defeat our enemies. And number three, we'll be blessed with lots of blessings. And then look at Numbers 25, 1 through 3. Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with who? 
Okay, here we go. Here, uh, Balaam tells Balak, look, I can't curse them. The only way God is going to curse them, if you make them do something against God and they'll bring the curse upon themselves. I can't curse them, but they can curse themselves. So what I want you to do is bring all the Moabite daughters over here to seduce the Israeli men, and then God will curse them because they're not keeping the commandments. Isn't that fascinating? Okay. And then they called the people to sacrifice of their gods, and the people ate. They bowed down to their gods, and Israel joined himself to Baal Peor. And the angle, anger of the Lord was kindled against them. Wow. This is not good. And so, Numbers 25, 6 and 7. Behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses. Well, Moses is married to a Midianite. So here this Simeonite brings this Midianite woman right in the front of the side of Moses and in the side of all the congregation of the children of Israel the ones who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And then comes Phineas or Pincus, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest. He saw it. He rose up from among the congregation. He took a javelin in his hand and shish kebobbed him right through his back and her stomach. Just nailed, kills them both. Because there was this huge plague that was going on because of what Zimri and Cosby, the two names of those people, had done. Wow. Okay, so God is upset. And then, look at this. Remember I told you Balak's grandson was who? Eglon. In Judges, we hear about Eglon, chapter 3, verse 14 through 17. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man who was left-handed. And by him, the children of Israel sent a present to Eglon, the king of Moab. But Ehud made him a dagger, which had two edges of a cubit length. That's 18 inches. And he girded under his raiment upon his right thigh, and he brought the present to Eglon, king of Moab. And Eglon was a very fat man. And what uh, happens, he stabs him. Well, first off, he said he had a present for Eglon. And so Eglon made all of his servants leave. They close and lock the door. Eglon goes up to give him the present with his right hand, stabs him and kills him. And it says the whole knife got stuck in his body. He couldn't even pull it out. He was so fat. So he turns and he runs. Well, Eglon, his granddaughter was Ruth. Okay, so just kind of giving you some history here. Um, so just as Balak tried to curse the Israelite people three times with the aid of Balaam, Ruth was told three times to go back home. And of course, he doesn't. And now we're going to take a look at the Haftor next week. Announcement I forgot to make. Next week, we're going to talk about Phineas. That's the Torah portion, how, what he did. And Danny Ben-Gigi is going to be here to speak. So get ready. It's going to be awesome. So the Haftorah now is Micah chapter 6, 1 through 5. Why do you think Micah is the Haftorah or the portion of the Tanakh that matches the Torah? Well, look and see. Okay, let me ask you this. What was the sin or the big sin of the Moabites and the Ammonites? Do you remember? Who was their God? Who did they serve? Who was the God? No, not in Baal. The Moabites and the Ammonites served Molech. They offered their firstborn to their God. They were the ones who started child sacrifice. So the Moabites and the Ammonites thought the way they would please God, the only way they could please God is by giving them their firstborn child. So now let's look at Micah. 
And to better understand this, you got to know who's doing the talking. So I'm going to explain this. It says here now what the Lord says, arise and plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O you mountains, what the Lord's complaint is. And you strong foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a complaint against the heathen. That's not what it says. <laughs> Who's his complaint against? His own people. And he's also going to contend with Israel. And then look what he says. He says, oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Testify against me. Can you imagine... Uh, the God of creation, rather than just crushing him, says, what have I done to you? This is amazing. Just like the donkey says to Balaam, what have I done to you? And God is saying to his people, what have I done to you? Why have you treated me this way? Testify against me. Who's going to stand before God and say, here's why I didn't serve you? I don't think so. He says, I'm the one who brought you from the land of Egypt. I'm the one who redeemed you from the house of bondage. I sent you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. Oh, my people, don't you remember what Balak, the king of Moab, canceled? And what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him? From Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord? Okay, Micah is like a thousand years later. And what is he talking about? He's talking about sacrificing their kids. And look at Micah 6, 6, and 7. Look, this is now Israel speaking. And Israel goes, well, what shall I come before the Lord with? And bow before myself before the high God? Am I supposed to come to him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Is the Lord going to be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Am I supposed to give my firstborn now, God, for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? This was the attitude. Here the Moabites would offer their sacrifice, their children to the pagan God and they're thinking that's how the God of Israel wants to be served. What are you talking about? So look at verse 8. It says, look, he's shown you. Notice it doesn't say he told you. It says he showed you, oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? He just wants you to be honest. Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. Notice it doesn't say walk humbly in front of this powerful God. We have a humble God. And then we have a proud man standing next to a humble God. And here's why I didn't serve you. Wow. He says walk humbly with the creator. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Now was God a burden to Israel? Never. God was pleading his case. He's the one who delivered them. He's the one who redeemed them. He's the one who provided them with leadership. He adopted them and he blessed them. And this is how he is treated. Wow. And so this is where, again, we need to change our perceptions. What is God really like? He's not some four throwing lightning bolts at the people below. He's not an AI computer either. But here's what's important. We'll close with these two slides. This coming Tuesday, here we are on the 20th. This Tuesday is the very day they worship the golden calf. This coming Tuesday is the very day they worship the golden calf. And it begins, and you can see this on our calendar, if you get our calendar, current calendar. It starts on the 17th of Tammuz. How would you like to be born on the 17th of Tammuz? I was born an hour before sunset on the, I was just right there. But anyway, it begins what's called the dire straits, which is for three weeks. 
And guess what? At the end of the three weeks, it ends with the 13th of August, which is the very day the temple was destroyed twice by Nebuchadnezzar and by the Romans. It happened both times on the 9th of Av. So the next three weeks are very serious. The Jews have been fasting for 1,500 years, okay, because of this. Now, how many of you are familiar with a prophecy in Zechariah chapter 8? In Zechariah chapter 8, it says uh, there are fast days. It doesn't mention them other than like the fourth month, the fifth month. But if you don't know that, if anyone considers themselves a prophet or interested in prophecy and you don't know the biblical calendar, you're clueless. I'm sorry, but you're clueless. In Zechariah 8, it says prophetically God is going to turn the 17th of Tammuz, and the 9th of Av from a fast day to a feast day. That hasn't happened yet. Which means a big war because the 17th of Tammuz, okay, is the very day that both Nebuchadnezzar and Rome, you know, 500 years later, broke through the northern uh, side of Israel to attack. The ninth of Av, why is the ninth of Av so bad? What happened on the ninth of Av in the Torah? The spies brought the bad report. And so that day has become a fast day for a long time because that's the day they had to go 40 years in the wilderness. And what do we know? Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple on the ninth of Av, the same day the spies brought the bad report. Rome destroyed the temple on the ninth of Av. In 1290, all the Jews were kicked out of England on the 9th of Av. In 1492, all the Jews were kicked out of Spain on the 9th of Av. World War I started on the 9th of Av. Hitler's proclamation to kill the Jews was on the 9th of Av. Do we see a pattern? Yeah. I just look for patterns, okay? But God said these are going to turn into feast days in Zechariah 8. What that means, since it's tied to the destruction of Israel and Jerusalem, there is a big war coming potentially could be over the next three weeks where Lebanon or Iran attacks Israel, that's the only way it's going to turn from a fast day to a feast day because Israel is going to win. So we need to be praying this year because there's a good chance Lebanon and Iran could attack Israel in the next three weeks. We're supposed to know the times and seasons, okay? That means literally we are about to enter the time and season in the next three weeks that that prophecy could be fulfilled. I'm not saying it will be fulfilled this year. It could be next year. But if you're not looking and watching, you won't even know a prophecy has been fulfilled. Does that make sense? All right, let's stand. <clears throat> All right. Avinu Malkainu, our Father King, we just thank you so much that you're giving us eyes to see, ears to hear, heart to understand. We don't want to be like Balaam, who couldn't see anything, was totally clueless of the judgment that is coming. We want to be aware the judgment is coming so we can let others know, and it's because we love them, not because we want to scare them. Father, I just pray right now, as you know, judgment's coming to America. And we just pray right now that you would bring many people into your kingdom uh, through this judgment. And Father, that we would never be afraid or in fear because we know you have everything under control. And we just thank you for all of those that are watching locally around the United States and all around the world. Father, we pray that you would bless them, and we thank you for each and every one who brings any kinds of tithes or offerings here Father, so that we can continue to magnify the Torah, make it honorable once again. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Are you ready? 
Buckle up. Here we are. We're going to present Solomon, the epitome of a human king and its biggest failure. <laughs> All right. Yeah, part two. Uh, here we go. How many of you know wisdom doesn't always cut it? Everything. Well, wisdom. What's wrong with wisdom? A big problem with wisdom. And if I was Solomon, I wouldn't have asked for wisdom. You know what I would have asked for? Obedience. Because that is wisdom. <laughs> that is huge. Well, let's take a look at some things. It says in 1 Kings 11.42, And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all of Israel was... Okay. Now, if you want to take a picture of this, you can. But I want to give you an idea of what happened. The year 2859 AM. Now, what that means is from Adam. This isn't AD. It's not BC. This is only going forward from the creation of Adam and Eve. I have the timeline. And believe me, this is exactly the very year these things happened. David is born in the year 2859. David becomes king at 30 years old. It says it in the Bible, so we know that's 2889. Solomon was born when David was 50 years old. And so that would uh, be in 2909. We know David dies when he's 70 years old because David was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned 40 years. Okay. And so David dies in 2929, which means Solomon becomes king in 2929. And if you remember, David, who became a king at 30, said Solomon is young and tender. He was only 20. So when Solomon becomes king, he was 20 years old. And then, as I pointed out, four years later in 2933, the Bible says it was in his fourth year that he finally laid the foundation. Here, everything was ready. And he waited four years. And then it says in the seventh year, he decides to uh, build his own house in 2936. And Solomon is 27. So in his seventh year, he started with 20. In his seventh year, he's 27 years old. And he begins to build his own house. And it says it took him 13 years to build that. Seven years to build Solomon's temple. 13 years to build his own house. And so we see uh, in 2940, the 11th year, the temple is finished and Solomon is 31. And then in 2949, his 20th year, he finally, his house is finished and the Lord appears to him a second time. So when he's 20 years old, the Lord appears to him. And then the Lord appears to him when he's 40 years old, after he's done building his own house and Pharaoh's daughter's house and the temple house. And then in 2969, the 40th year of his reign, he dies. And since he was 20 years old when he started, we know he was 60 years old. This is just using math and what the Bible says. I don't make this stuff up. But so I wanted to give you an idea how old Solomon was when he, or how old David was when Solomon was born, how old Solomon was when he became king. And then the Bible gives you a timeline. But God appeared to him twice, appeared to him when he was 20, and appeared to him when he was 40. Okay, do you see that? So God appears to him twice. Now, let's go to Matthew 15, verse 21 and 22. We're seeing in the Gospels that Yeshua left and he departed to go into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Where are they located? Lebanon. Lebanon. And it says, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried out to him, have mercy on me, Lord, you son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Can you believe it? Here, a Canaanite knew he was the Messiah because his dad was supposedly Joseph. The fact that she's saying son of David, she's saying, I know you're the Messiah. And this was a non-Jew from a, another country. Now, take a look at these two next PowerPoints. Okay, this is Lebanon. We're going to be talking about Tyre, which is here, 
Sidon, which Yeshua goes clear up to Sidon. Okay, he is way out of the territory. And this is the border of Israel and Lebanon. And it comes all the way up. You see that arrow? This city called Metula is in Israel. But it's about the same line as Tyre. So Israel's going like this. And then uh, here's Kiryat Shimona, which just got hit with some missiles I saw this morning. But anyway, so I just wanted you to know that's the border and how it curves up into Lebanon. But there's Tyre and Sidon. Now what I'm going to do is show you another one. Okay, so there's the Lebanon border. Uh, there's Metula again, and there's Tyre. And here's uh, Haifa. Many of you don't have ever been to Haifa. And then this is Acre or Akko. And on our Israel trip, we're going to take a little boat ride and go from Haifa to Akko, which will be a lot of fun. But here's Nazareth, just to kind of give you an idea. And do you know what this big circle is? You're not going to believe it. We're going to get to this verse. Solomon decides out of his own choice, he is going to give away this area to Hiram, king of Tyre, for helping him build the temple. It says in the Bible, he gave him 20 cities in the Galilee. Who does Solomon think he is that he has authority to give away the promised land? The whole reason Solomon is a type of Antichrist is he believes in land for peace. He wanted peace. So he made unbiblical covenants with all the pagans by marrying their daughters so he could have peace and no adversary. All right. And then he tries to give away. God gave them the promised land. Who is he to give it away? And that wasn't even Judah's territory. He's from, you know, I mean, this, this belonged to uh, like the tribe of Asher. You know, how do you think they feel giving away their land? Who does he think he is? All right. Okay, so let's take a look here. In uh, 1 Kings 3, 3 through 5, I, I have to show you how it begins. It begins well. Solomon loved the Lord. He walked in the statutes of David, his father, but he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. Why did he do that? Well, there's no temple. He hadn't built it yet. So he's sacrificing in the high places. But look at this. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there. That's where Moses' tabernacle was. Okay. And it says, for that was the great high place. And the thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. Can you imagine a thousand burnt offerings? offerings. And then in Gibeon, while he's in Gibeon, what happens? The Lord appears to him in a dream at night. And God said, ask what I will give you. And what did he ask for? Wisdom. And let's look at 1 Kings 3.15. Solomon awoke and found out, oh, this was just a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and he offers up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. So what's fascinating here, he's, burnt, he's doing burnt offerings in two places. Okay? He should only be doing it in Jerusalem. That's what God had said. And the ark was there. Okay. Now we look at 1 Kings 4.29. God gave Solomon what? Okay, God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding because that's what he asked for. And it says he gave him how much? Exceedingly much. Here's the problem with wisdom. There's two kinds of wisdom. Look at the book of Jacob. It's James in English, 13 through 17. Who has wisdom and good sense among you? Let him make his works clear by a life of what kind of wisdom? The wisdom. But if you have bitter envy in your heart and desire to get the better of the others, don't have pride in this, talking falsely against what is true. This wisdom is not from heaven, but it is of the earth and the flesh, 
in the evil one. Where envy is and the desire to get the better of the other, there is no order but every sort of evil doing. The wisdom which is from heaven is first holy. Then it is gentle, readily giving away in argument, saying, okay, fine, you win. Full of peace and mercy and good works, not doubting, not seeming other than it is. So there's two kinds of wisdom. There's satanic wisdom and understanding, and there's godly wisdom and understanding. Now, we know from Isaiah 11, verse 1 and 2, speaking about the Messiah, there will come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch, referring to Messiah, will grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him with the spirit of what? Wisdom and understanding. So wisdom and understanding is phenomenal if it's heavenly wisdom and understanding. But watch what happens. Look at Ezekiel 28, verse 1 and 2. <clears throat> the word of the Lord came, against, came again to me, Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, say to the who? Prince of where? That's Tyre. Okay? Speak to the prince of Tyre, thus saith the Lord God, because your heart has been lifted up and you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. This is referring to Satan, who is represented by the prince of Tyre. Now look how it goes on in verse four and five. With your wisdom and with your understanding, you have gotten riches. You've gotten gold and silver into your treasures by your great wisdom and by your traffic, okay, sell, a merchant selling stuff, you've increased your riches, but what has happened, your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Now let's look at verse seven and eight. Behold, therefore I will bring strangers on you, the terrible of the nations, and they're gonna draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom. And they will defile your brightness. They'll bring you down to the pit and you will die the death of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. This is talking about Satan, who is like Phil, the prince of Tyre. All right, but now look at Ezekiel 28, verse 12. Now, son of man, take up a lamentation against the king of Tyre. And the king of Tyre say to him, thus says the Lord God, you seal up the sum. You are full of wisdom. You're perfect in beauty. Satan was full of wisdom and beauty, which God gave him, but he perverted it because his heart got lifted up. Matter of fact, look at Ezekiel 28, 13. You have been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Wow, hello. This is talking about Satan. And Satan is like filled the prince of Tyre, the king of Tyre. Okay, so let's go on to the next verse, 14 and 15. You are the anointed cherub that covers, and I have set you that way. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in the ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. And that's when Satan fell. Satan, God created perfect. Filled him with wisdom, filled him with beauty. But what happens? He thinks he's better than everybody else. His heart gets lifted up and down he goes. All right. Look at Ezekiel 28, 17. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, and then you corrupted your wisdom. I want everyone to think about that. God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding at the beginning, and he loved the Lord God, and God loved him. But what happens? All of the riches he got, because he had wisdom and understanding, corrupted his wisdom to where now he was doing what would benefit him rather than God's kingdom. Wisdom can be corrupted. Even heavenly wisdom can be corrupted. Now, wait. We are talking about the prince of who? And the king of Tyre. Now let's go to 
1 Kings 7, 13, and 14, King Solomon set, sent and fetched Hiram out of where? Tyre. He was the son of a widow of the tribe of Naphtali, but his father was a man of Tyre. He was a worker of brass. Brass speaks of judgment. He, and look at this. Hiram was filled with what? Wow. You got a man of Tyre filled with wisdom and understanding working with Solomon who was filled with wisdom and understanding working together to build the temple. And he came to King Solomon and wrought all of his work. Okay, now look at first Kings. Chapter five and verse four. Look what Solomon said. The Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither an adversary nor evil result. At the beginning, when Solomon was good, God made sure his adversaries stayed away. And so, if you remember now, the tabernacle of Moses Everything was built willingly. People brought everything willingly. They said, okay, stop, stop, stop. Solomon raises a tax, a levy. And the levy was 30,000 people. Okay, I want you to start kind of somewhat adding this up in your, how, in your mind. Look at verse 15 and 16. Solomon had 70,000 people who bear burdens, 80,000 people that were cutting down trees, besides Solomon's chief officers that were over the work, 3,300 who bear rule over the people that wrought in the work. This is the where it says he was whipping them with whips, Solomon was having hard laborer bosses who would whip the people to get them to work harder and faster to get the temple done. Okay, you add this up. This is like 180,000 people. 180,000 people. That's a pretty big workforce. And yet, as you saw last week, Solomon in the prayer of the dedication Seven times says, in the house which I have built, I have built, I have built. He didn't lay a finger on that temple. It says God had given David the plants, the patterns. David gave the gold, the silver, and all of these laborers are working. And Solomon has the gall to say, the house which I have built. That shows you a little narcissism there. I didn't mention these numbers last week, but I want you to see now what I was talking about. Why in the world? I mean, if I was standing there listening to his prayer, I would think, well, what about me? I, you know. Now, look at this. 1 Kings 8, 63 and 64. Solomon offered a sacrifice of Peace offerings. This is at the dedication of the temple, right? Now, let me ask you this. How many of you brides at your wedding want some other lady to come in and try to steal the show? Looking fancier, you know, or whatever. It's kill. This is the dedication of the temple to God. They're dedicating the temple to God. And look at this. Solomon offers a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered to the Lord, 22,000 oxen, 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. The same day did the king hallow the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord. Wait a minute. The king can't hallow squat. It's the priest who hallow things. And King Solomon says, I'm going to hallow, uh, you know, the middle of the women's court. 
It says, and that's where he offered his burnt offerings and meat offerings and the fat of peace offerings because the brazen altar that God had said you are to build was too little to receive all of his burnt offerings and meat offerings and peace offerings. Here's a dedication of the temple. God gives them the, the exact dimensions of the brazen altar that they are to sacrifice on. But Solomon thinks that's too insignificant for what I'm going to do. So I'm going to build an altar in the middle of the women's court. And that's where everyone can look at me, sacrifice all of these animals. Look at me, look at me, look at my offering for God. The word too little is katan. It literally not only means too little, it means insignificant compared to what Solomon was offering. Uh, isn't that just mind-blowing when you detail these verses? Now, here's something else that I just decided to add, and it's not in your notes. Who remembers the Hebrew word for a burnt offering? What? Ola. Ola. There's your minka, okay, and there's your shalamim, peace offerings, meat offerings, and your ola is a burnt offering. The difference between these, the burnt offering is never, 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 never for sin, okay? What it was is for you to draw near to God. You would lay your hands on whatever you're going to give, a sheep, a goat, a bull, and then... Uh, the priest would sacrifice the bull and nobody got a side of beef. Nobody got a steak. The entire thing was consumed to God. Can you imagine what it would cost to burn an entire cow and you don't get one T-bone out of it? And the priest doesn't get anything out of it. Some offerings, the priest gets it. You know, some offerings, everybody gets it. But this offering... Nobody gets it. It's completely consumed and destroyed, and it's called the what offering? Ola. Now, I'm going to introduce something to you that is going to be mind-blowing. Ola became Holocaust, the Holocaust. A burnt offering. A Holocaust. But watch this. In Mark 12, 33, it talks about how you're to love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your soul, with all your strength, to love your neighbor as himself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And this would be Ola, but in Greek, it's the word Holocaust. We get the word Holocaust from the Greek, not the Hebrew. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the Shoah? Has anyone ever heard of the Shoah? Okay. Say Shoah. Shoah. Never forget that word. And I'm gonna, that's what the Holocaust is referred to as the Jew by the Jews. It's called the Shoah, not really the Holocaust. Now, they will call it a Holocaust, but it doesn't mean what you think. The difference between the Holocaust and Shoah is this. A Holocaust is a burnt offering that is acceptable to God. A Holocaust is a burnt offering acceptable to God. A Shoah, look at Zephaniah 115, or you can write it down. This is talking about the tribulation. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble, distress. It's a day of wasteness and desolation. That is a Shoah. And it even says it twice in Hebrew. It has the word Shoah twice. Wasteness and desolation. So the moral of the story, never call the Holocaust a Holocaust. Because that means God desired the Jews to die. It's to be called a Shoah in Hebrew, which means complete desolation that God did not desire. When we call the Holocaust the Holocaust, we're saying it's something God wanted to do to the Jewish people. 
So I'm trying to teach you a new word. Whenever you hear someone use the word holocaust, that means a sacrificing God wanted. He, it's not a holocaust. It's a showa. It's a complete wasteness, a desolation of the nation of Israel. Does that help anybody? Okay, now, moving on. The Lord had already appeared to Solomon once when he was 20 years old. And the Lord said, you behave and all will be good for you. Now, it's been 20 years later. And look at 1 Kings 9, 1 and 2. When it had come to pass, when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord, which only took seven years, and the king's house, which took 13 years, and all Solomon's desire, which he pleased to do, the Lord appears to Solomon a second time as he had appeared to him in Gibeon. And it's the same thing. Look at what the Lord said in 1 Kings 9, 4 through 10. God says, look, Solomon, if, 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 if you walk before me as David, your father walked in integrity of heart, uprightness, and you do all I've commanded you and you keep my statutes and my judgments, I will establish the throne of your kingdom upon Israel forever. As I promised to David, your father saying, there will not fail you a man upon the throne of Israel, but, but, and if. You at all turn from following me, you or your children, and you don't keep my commandments. You don't keep my statutes, which I set before you, but you go and serve other gods and worship them. I'm going to cut off Israel out of the land which I've given them and this house, which I've hallowed for my name. And will I cast out of my sight and Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all people. And at this house, which is high, everyone that passes by will be astonished and hiss. And they're going to say, why in the world did the Lord do this to this land and to this house? And it says, and they're going to answer, it's because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought forth their fathers out of Egypt. They've taken up other gods. They've worshipped them and served them. Therefore, the Lord has brought upon them all this evil. And it came to pass at the end of 20 years when Solomon had built the two houses, the house of the Lord and the king's house. So there we see right there what I was talking about, the 20 years he's done building his house and the Lord's house. And so he, he was doing somewhat good for his first 20 years. And then everything falls apart the last. 20 years. Look at 1 Kings 9, 11 through 13. Now Hiram, the king of Tyre, furnished Solomon with cedar trees, fir trees, gold, according to all his desire, that then King Solomon gave Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. Who does he think he is that he can give away the promised land? And so Hiram comes out of Tyre to see the cities which Solomon had given him, and they didn't please him. And he said, what cities are these which you've given me, my brother? And he called them the land of Kabul unto this day. Kabul means good for nothing. These, you're trying to give me a piece of garbage as a gift? Well, guess what? That's what the Palestinians do to this day. Every time they're trying to be given a state, they say no. Constantly, they've been offered a state, and they never agree. They always say no. Okay, in uh, the book of Revelation, it says, here is wisdom. The number of the Antichrist is what? Six, six, six. Now, when you think of wisdom, who do you immediately think of? Solomon. Well, look at this. In 1 Kings 10, 14 and 15, the weight of gold that came to Solomon in year, one year was 666. Six, 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 666 talents of gold. Wow, I wonder if there's a connection in Revelation with wisdom and 666 with Solomon. 
Beside that, he had the merchantmen and of the traffic. Here he's a trafficker, just like in Ezekiel, Tyre was a trafficker, and he was full of wisdom and understanding. And here is Solomon, full of wisdom and understanding, doing trafficking, okay? Now look at 1 Kings 10, 22 and 23. King had, a sea, had at sea a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. And every three years, the merchantmen would be bringing gold and silvery, ivory and apes and peacocks. So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. And the king of Tyre, his riches and his beauty is what lifted him up and God brought him down to the pit. Okay, so right here, there's the little boat. And here it goes down there. And then Solomon would take all of this stuff to build the temple from Hiram. Now, let me ask you something. What would you think if Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu gave nuclear material to Iran? Would that be smart? Okay. Not really. The modern day tank equivalent in Solomon's day was the horse and chariot. Like Egyptian, Pharaoh had horses and chariots. And God specifically told in 500 years earlier to Moses, when you select a king, make sure they do not multiply horses. I'm going to talk about that next week or the week after that. And they're not to go back to Egypt at all to multiply horses. Well, let's look at why Solomon. In 1 Kings 10, 28 and 29, the horses which Solomon had were brought out of Egypt. Oh, he can't go there, so he'll have the horses come up here. And the king's merchants received them in droves. Each drove at a price. A chariot came up and went out of Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. And so look at this. For all the kings of the Hittites and Syria, did they bring them out by their means? Solomon was an arms merchant. And he gave the arms to the enemy. Here he's giving, he's buying horses and chariots out of Egypt. He's not supposed to do. And he gives them or sells them to the Hittites, to the king of Syria. These, do you know what the word Hittite means in Hebrew? Terrorists. And what is America doing now with Iran? They're giving them billions of dollars. Do you see how things repeat? Think about that. King Solomon, he's supposed to be wise. And he's bringing up horses and chariots. And then later you find the Syrians attack Israel with their horses and chariots. That's what I'm saying. Solomon corrupted his wisdom. Now, look at 1 Kings 11, 9 through 11. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and said, quit it. <laughs> that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. So look what happens. The Lord tells Solomon, as because if you have done this and you've not kept my covenant, my statutes, which I've commanded you, I will surely rend the kingdom from you and I'm going to give it to your servant. And so now look what happens in 1 Kings 11, 14. The Lord stirred up a adversary, Hadad the Edomite. And he was of the king's seed in Edom. Isn't that interesting? One of his own kids from one of his thousand wives rose up against him. Look at verse 23 through 26. And then God stirred up another adversary, Rezon, the son of Eladah, which fled from his lord, Hadadezer, king of Zobah. And he gathered men to him and became captain over a band. When David slew them of Zobah, they went to Damascus. 
and dwelt there and reigned in Damascus. And he was an adversary. You notice Damascus is in Syria, the ones he's been supplying weapons to. He was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon. Beside the mischief that Hadad did, and he abhorred Israel, he reigned over Syria, and Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephrathite of Zareda, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zeruah, what a woman, even he lifted up his hand against the king. So all of a sudden, what do you see? All these adversaries, the Lord is rising up against Solomon. Now, let's look at Deuteronomy 17, 16. This is 400 years before Solomon. God says, look, when you ask for a king, the king shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply the horses. For the Lord has said, you, I don't want you returning that way. Okay, well, 1 Kings 4, 26, Solomon had 40,000 stalls for horses and his chariots, 12,000 horsemen. He may be wise, but he definitely forgot his multiplication tables because God said, don't multiply. God told the king he was not to multiply horses for himself. So was Solomon being rebellious or maybe in all his wisdom, he just never bothered to learn his multiplication tables. It gets worse. Not only did Solomon disregard God's word about multiplying horses, but he purchased them from Egypt, which was exactly what God specifically said, don't do. And then he would sell the chariots and horses he imported from Egypt. And then 1 Kings 10, 29 again, here he is exporting them. Now, as I said earlier, the Hittite literally means terrorist. Uh, can you imagine, like he said, if Netanyahu were to do that? That'd be the stupidest thing I've ever heard. In Deuteronomy, Israel was specifically commanded not to make any covenants with the indigenous Canaanites. But look what happens. Deuteronomy 7, 1 and 2. God says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and cast out many nations before you, such as the Hittites, Gergesites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Ites, 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 seven nations that are greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you're to conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make what? No covenant with them. The first thing he does is marry a thousand alien wives. He wasn't supposed to marry a one of them. And he marries a thousand of them. And then it says, and I'll show you the next time what he ends up doing. It says he builds the God, a thousand gods for every wife. And he offers sacrifice to them. This is 1 Kings 11, 1 through 4. He does sacrifice to all, for all of the, his wives' gods, he does sacrifice. And guess what? Solomon, his wife, I can show you in the Torah, one of his many foreign wives was an Ammonite. And how do they serve their God? They offer their firstborn to Molech. Ah, Solomon was the first Israel king to do child sacrifice. Solomon is the one who instituted child sacrifice. It says right there. So we're going to look at that more next week. But uh, the point of all of this is to show you Solomon totally corrupted his wisdom, his understanding, and he's a type of antichrist, not a type of the Messiah. All right. With that said, let's stand.